Good morning. My name is Susie Cornwall, and I have the great privilege of reading the scripture for you today. And I'm reading out of Revelation, the fourth chapter. And if it's at all possible for you to stand in honor and respect and reverence for the word of God, I would invite you to do so. Revelation chapter four, beginning at verse one. After this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal, and around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature, with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature, like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them, with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Thank you for honoring the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me work upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be much stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. Mm -hmm. And there I find you in the mysteries and oceans deep. My faith will stand. Oh. Your ways are found in deepest waters. Sovereign end will be my guide. Where feet may fall, I feel so hard. You never fail, and you will stop. Let me work the 
There's a reality to the fact that if we are going to walk with Jesus Christ, we're not going to understand every single thing about God and his ways. Yeah. We are called to a place of trust, and one of the reasons we wanted to open with that beautiful song this morning as well, and thank you so much for an amazing worship time, worship team that was uh, yeah. so tremendous, was I think that song holds intention so well what, what we experience in, in this life, that we are, we are called into the great unknown by our God and Father who loves us and has the very best for us, and yet it's hard for us, and he knows that it's, it's a challenge for us to step out into those dark waters and the place that is deeper than we can stand in our own strength. But even in the face of those holy mysteries, mm. like our faith can flourish right. in that place. Right. And it's not because we're great or because we have fantastic abilities or, or we prayed really hard or we really studied or whatever it is. Because the Spirit of God that lives within each, each and every believer, we can be in those places of holy mystery and realize that, God, you are so much greater. Yes. So much bigger. Yes. So much more magnificent and so yes. much smarter <laughs> than I will ever be able to grasp. And yet I'm going to trust you in all the things that I don't understand because we are in the Spirit and the Spirit yeah. is within us. And so the spiritual journey that we get to experience, right, is one of unveiling, in a sense. Knowing God more deeply, Amen. growing in that knowledge and understanding. Um, I, it's our prayer, and I, I just, I'm, I'm I find myself uh, coming back to this point over these last couple of years in particular. It just seems like more than ever, again, in my, my knowledge, my, my little 53 years, it just seems what the church really needs, the, the, the body of Christ, the, the invisible, the, those that are born again, the church, the living God. Um, we, need a, we need a fresh revelation of who Jesus is. Like, like at the end of the day, to know God for who He is in, a, in the most pure sense. And, and in, in, in a very real way, that's, that is a journey, as you said. But, our, but ultimately, for what it looks like for our faith to flourish, right? Like, like to abound in this abundant life. Well, let's embrace that which is actually the grounding of all blessings. Jesus Christ Himself, the very person. Um, the we're, we, we, we will always fall short when we try and reduce God to our finite ideas and thoughts. We, uh, if you've been to our uh, office, and you notice I said ours, um, only one desk in there, but hey. Um, I have a big conference table now. Yeah. So it's getting bigger. The, uh, our office, it, well, that's because Jennifer especially has embraced these things called books, like actual paper products. I have... Four, almost 400 books just on this, just want to point it's out. the same. 
your 400 books take up almost the office. So anyways, but, but those books are rich with incredible thoughts and understandings of people that have, that have studied God and want to unpack and explain. I love that. But with all the books, with all the libraries and all the world, right, can never contain who God really is. And like, there's an aspect that, that we're going to need all eternity. Well, it's hard for us too, because I think it's humbling to acknowledge our intellectual limitations. Yeah. The fact that he didn't explain it all to us. We don't have the full picture at this moment. And, but that's what makes this journey so exciting and we get to do together. And so I, this morning as we uh, were headed into the throne room, I, I just uh, make mention of a couple of things. One of the regarding that video um, I, what, that, that is so impacting to me is how the son reflects the father. Beautiful. And that's so father, God the father, God the son kind of moment, you know. And, uh, and it's also us with the Father. Like, how do we worship? Like, how do we actually do this? Yeah, just sit at his feet. I'll show you, right? And then there's this, we learn from each other piece. Like, True. have you noticed that? And I, all of our students are, are, have their, um, once a month, they, they get together and get a chance to have some studies uh, along these same lines but with, with Pastor Long. But w- that's one of the dynamics and something we just really sought to embrace as a community, the multi-generational piece. And we literally, they get taught at the youngest age, learn, watch, just watch those that are in the congregation that are older than you. Watch how they worship. How are you going to learn it? Just watch. Which is a really great reminder for us to be on point. Right? Because they're watching us. Yeah? So if we're falling asleep during my teaching, that's a real problem. Uh, the kids are watching you. So anyways, you never watch, fall asleep on yours. Anyways, no, let me... No, they uh, one other verse as we go into this before we head to the throne room. Solomon. Like, this is a really great verse uh, to consider. You know, here he is to, to build the temple. And he, we just see some of these Old Testament persons that really connect. In Second Chronicles, he's about to build the temple. He says this, the house that I am to build will be great. Like he's really very, you know, excited about that. But, but God is greater than all gods. Like that was, a, that was something that Solomon actually recognized. But who is able to build him a house? Since heaven, even highest heaven, cannot, what? Contain him. Like think about that. And yet he goes and builds the temple, which was glorious in itself. But even in all the glory, so it says two things. One is we're a reminder, there's never, you're, we're never going to be able to contain God. Like any one thing, any one person, any one book is not going to be able to represent God. But then there's still this part of, we want to participate in displaying His glory. And part of the way we do that is by unleashing our gifts and strengths and talents and weaknesses. We get to bring that to the table. And it becomes part of it. So Solomon did that. That's what, that's what he did. But it was always under the recognition that God is beyond our imaginations. He is so beyond, here's the key word, phrase, beyond us. He's beyond us. The moment that we try and contain, we all of a sudden have limited God and limited our engagement and worship with Him. Amen. So let me ask you uh, just two quick questions. Actually, one, one question. Because I, I think this just, this just plays well. So think about with me one thing in the past. And, and I'm going to ask you. I forgot to tell you that I was going to do this. But um, so, because uh, I know you love the spontaneous yeah, thing. Yes, it's, it's the, my favorite part. Yeah, sure. that, that, that you would love <laughs> to have a recording of. But here, it can't be like a, a biblical story Not, or anything. No events. biblical history? No biblical okay. history. Alrighty. But anything that you would just love to be, how they say, a fly on the wall for mm-hmm. that. Like, mm-hmm. think about that okay. with me. How many, how many have got one? Like, you would just love. Like, and you're, you're like, is it something good? So seriously, raise your hand if you've, got, if you've got one. Okay, there is zero imagination going on right now. All right. Think you're trying to think, like, right? Or do you have one? Well, so I was thinking maybe it'd be cool to see Martin Luther, you know, do his thing at the Diet of Worms. Yeah. Or maybe okay. William Wilberforce, you know, arguing like in Parliament, That'd the abolition cool. of That's slavery. Cool. That would have been good. But I think we'll go a little bit more closer, closer to home. And that is probably 
that uh, dance contest that you won when you were in high school. I'm, I wasn't there. We didn't know each other then. Wow. We were, we were in our mid-20s. You really thought met. to bring that up. I did. It hit me while I was sitting down there. I just wow. was like the spontaneous moment of, that's it. You are really bringing that up right now. I know. When would I ever do something like that to you? Of create, go oh reach goodness. for some idea. Well, all right. I think we so, have tape on probably all that, right? So, <laughs> so now, there's YouTube. Now I, yeah, so. All right. Another day, I'll have to explain that because there's a, yeah. So that's the after the show yeah. show yeah. Uh, moment. All right. So, all right. So, because I was thinking, I was, I, I went to his, history as well. So I was thinking, but now I'm really thinking of something about you as See, well. I mean, I'm sure. Like, okay. We just need right. to keep moving. So, so. <laughs> you know, the, boy, the, the formation of the Declaration of Independence, you know, some of the early uh, founding fathers kinds of discussions uh, could be pretty fantastic. You know, and because it is, like you, you read things in history, but you're like, I want to be there, right? That's true. Because yeah. we're, we're curious, yeah, right. by, and that's a good thing. So here's what happens in the book of Revelation. Today's text, Susie so beautifully read it, it offers us an inside experience of the greatest place in the world. Like that right. blows our mind, mm -hmm. and it's intended to blows our, blow our mind. Within the throne room, Here's what I, 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 we just dare not miss this. The book of Revelation, as we were talking, like some people get, we're so scared about it because we feel this incredible need to figure it all out. And I'm like, I really get uncomfortable with people. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll just say this, I've said it, I've said it privately to folks. I'm, I'm uncomfortable with people that feel like they've really figured out the book of Revelation. They've got it all figured out. And I'm like, I love you. But you are not that smart. And, and I mean, I don't, I don't say that, but, but like we just aren't. There's like, there's mysteries and there's things we can learn from each other. But, but really at the end of the day, let's get the experience that I really fundamentally is intended. That it would blow our mind. God is amazing, right? God, right. God is, is beyond us. And Amen. his throne room is, look, well, Let's unpack it. It's right. really right. It last, blows our mind. Last week, we talked about how Jesus is the center of revelation, that he is the heart of this entire book. And so as we go to our text this morning, verses 1 and 2, yeah. after this, I, that is John, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. I love this first part. The door Sorry. is open in heaven, right? Amen. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, this is, of course, the voice of Jesus, come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the Spirit, John writes, and behold, a throne stood in heaven and one seated on the throne. So we might want to ask ourselves, what did the first hearers understand? The people who received these letters, and we, last week we talked about how there were seven actual churches that were in Asia Minor during, during this time. And they, these letters were written to those specific churches. And the chapters just before this uh, we see Jesus giving John letters to go to these uh, particular churches, and, and he was diagnosing their problems and figuring out, you know, like telling them, these are your strengths, these are your weaknesses, this is what you need to do in order to come into line with the way that I would desire for you to be. So he's, Jesus is, is, you know, applauding their love and loyalty in some cases and then like spurring them on into greater right. consecration in others. So that's the context of this chapter that we just had read for us this morning. And Jesus is about to, he's inviting John to, to come up here, come up here to, to where he is and to receive visions that from, from this point on will show the future outworking of his victory on the cross. Everything that Jesus accomplished in his earthly life of, you know, sinless, perfect life and torturous, terrible death, resurrection and ascension back to the Father, all of that leading to this culmination of where we're all desiring to be. Right with him forever, right, in eternity. So Jesus is telling him, this is the context for all the visions that you're going to have yeah. after this. It's how my victory on the cross is going to work itself out in human history Good. and for each individual person. And I know some of the, some of the images that we had read for us were, were startling probably, hopefully causing amazement. Yeah. 
But the first hearers would have understood something about these images. This was not the first time. If they knew the Old Testament, which likely they did, these were Jewish Christians, most of them that were receiving these books, uh, that they would, have, they would have seen these images before in Daniel and Ezekiel. We see the, you know, the fantastic living creatures, right? Yeah. In Isaiah, we see the seraphim with the, with the, the wings and um, saying, holy, holy, holy. These were things that would have ticked in their memory. Oh, yeah, I remember that. These were things that had already been uh, written by previous prophets. And I think it's worth saying that God, you know, he speaks our language. He understands how we need to be communicated with. And that, that makes him wonderful and, yeah. and amazing. Yeah. And so we can go to him and ask him to, to explain things and, and to help us. We're told in the word to ask him for wisdom. And so when there's things yeah. that we don't understand, we can, we can ask him for that kind, of, that kind of clarity. So the people who would have read this would have certainly understood some things about John's images and symbols that he used here. And he certainly intended for them to understand some things about what, what he was saying. So we see God here first dealing with people in the first century. These are the people that were the first hearers. It was written to them and for us, right? Good Remember that the Bible was, was um, presented, was written through human, human writers by the power of the Holy Spirit. And it was written in a specific place and time. And so it's good for us to kind of have a sense of the culture to whom the Bible was given, right? Yeah. But these images and these prophetic visions, we see they're a kind of an amalgamation in some ways. They're varied and blended. When we look at the Ezekiel and the Daniel passage and then Revelation that we just read, but they symbolize mysterious unseen realities. So they're intended to stir wonder. Oh, what's that? We don't see that every day, right? Yeah. That's not just walking down cactus. Yeah. What is this? What's going on? So the first thing that we want to know, know about lately, this, have you seen uh, this? Never mind. Sorry. No? Just, just well, noticing some of the neighbors. But anyways. Well, but yes, generally the, I mean, the circle within the, the wheel within the wheel, not, not you don't see it every day, but it is it's really bizarreness in many levels and sorry go ahead no no it's talking. good it's good I'm just pretend I'm not here no okay. no I, oh, I would never want that I, I will never want that so these <laughs> mysteries are intended to stir amazement right so before exactly we right. launch into yeah. prophecies and, yeah. and figuring out you know when is he coming back or what's going to happen and what does that mean we need a rebirth of wonder yes. and this is sort of what we talked about last Foundation. week a little good. bit that good. the context of the entire word of God can be read as an understanding of who he is, a fresh astonishment of who God is, right? And what he has accomplished, what he's doing. That's the context for how we view the future. God is great. You said it already this yeah. morning. Yeah. Yeah. That God is great. And in that place, we can move forward into the things that we don't know, right? The things that are hard for us. Good. So the first thing that we want to talk about with in regard to this text this morning is that it's an invitation. We're being invited, like Jesus invited John, come up here and I will show you. We're invited up. We're invited further in, deeper in, in him, higher up in him. And this is the path of the Christian life, that we are invited to experience God. Not just an information download, <laughs> not just really studying hard, but we're invited to bring all of us, our, our intellect, our will, our emotions, our heart, every part of us, to have an encounter with the God of the universe, yes. right? Mm. We, are, we, we love to learn. We, that's part of what took us to seminary is desiring to learn and to have a, a, you know, as much knowledge as we can. But ultimately, no amount of knowledge is going to make up for voids in my life with him, in my encounter with mm. God. I need to be sitting that's with him and allowing him good. to interact with me far more than, than just, just studying. It can't be just head knowledge, right? Yeah. Jesus said to the Pharisees in John, he said, you know, you search the scriptures because, you know, you think that's the way to eternal life, but that's what's talking about me. He said, the scriptures point to me, Jesus says. That's how we know what life is, is this interaction with him to experience God for who he is and all that he desires for us to know about him. Yeah. Yeah. Information about God, that he is, we've already seen some, he's worthy, he's holy, he's the creator. Information about God without interaction with God, just I, I propose that it will eventually lead to disengagement. 
good. We have to have the up close and personal relationship with him, and that is certainly what he desires with us, is that we would know him face to face, more than our closest friend, more than our spouse, yeah. more than our children. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, and that's, that's why we wanted to sit on this for a second, we, we dare not miss, and I, I said this at the last, our last series when we were just following, about following Jesus, we, we really are people of invitation. And, and I think there's, it, it's real easy uh, to get uh, in a, some kind of spiritual, emotional funk, as it were, disconnect, disengagement, where we don't think that there is a place for me. Where we somehow think we belong on the outer courts rather than at the heart of where the very presence of God is. And as a result, that there's this lack of flourishing, the lack of transformation that happens. So really, like at the, at the, the, the big part of, of, of where we sit today is to be able to hear the word of the Lord that says there is an open door right now for us to come in and see Jesus. Like, come on in, but notice, and Jennifer just said it, it's not this way. It's up. It's up. There's a place that's higher, and that's where the invitation. The, the other part of the invitation is, is that leads us to is an invitation to know God in His majesty. Because where God is, in a real sense, is so not where we deal with all the, the grime and grum of doing life. God sits above it all while still at the Amen. same time being very present with us. Really but right. we've got, we, we must be reminded that He is King. We're not. And that He reigns and rules the kingdom. So we are kingdom people. Somebody say, I am a kingdom person. I'm a kingdom people. We, so here's the challenge that and, and Jen and I were just really, over the last couple of weeks, just talking about this on, on many levels. Here's a unique challenge for us in 2023. So first hearers, uh, totally connecting with emperor, king, kingdom, rulers, like authoritarian, like how many knew they were totally into that, right? They, that, that whole culture had been built out. All of their ancestry would totally understand kings and kingdoms. And they would think in terms of the emperor and they would even think in terms of emperor worship, right? So it makes sense that Scripture speaks first to those hearers they were hearing things from the context of being in a kingdom and being ruled. And in particular, the Jewish people and certainly eventually the Christians under the persecution would be absolutely understanding of what it is to be oppressed by a ruler. Good rulers, bad rulers. Here's a unique thing that we have in 2023. Kings, kingdoms, like that whole language is rather foreign to us, especially as Americans. Now think about this, because some of, some of us that have been studying American history for a while, we're like, yes, we have been liberated from the sovereign power of the king, right? How many have studied that in your history? Like that was the big liberation, the American Revolution, was we got to cast down and be separated, and the, the Brits are still upset about it. Bottom line, they're still upset. We go, but understandably, the American culture were like our breaking away. So like we rejected the idea of one person having rulership over us. I so don't want to get in the weeds of how we have been eroding back towards that direction with government. But anyways, we're going to move on. But there is a mentality as Americans that is very anti-kingship. And are, am, I, am I talking, like, does this make sense at all? It's true. It's right. now, now, again, our nationalism says this is a good thing, and we certainly would want a country that is free that way um, from tyranny. But I think, I think it's made its way into spiritual culture. 
that we like, we want to cast aside the idea of the majesty of a king. Because that sounds very, come on, help me out. That sounds very, yeah, very English. <laughs> As if there's not thousands of other, you know, kings. Anyway, so, but it is, it's, it's very controlling. Yeah? Anybody with me? We don't like, how, come on, am I talking to Americans or what? All right. We're like, we do not like being what? Control. Yeah. Because that's what kings do. So we don't like kings, and it feels very foreign for us to think in terms of a kingdom. But the entire language of Scripture is that. Now, now so I'm just in the weeds. I feel like maybe I'm in the weeds here, but listen to me. I'm just, I just want to build us out with the mindset to be very aware. We have built, whether we like it or not, especially as Americans, we have built an anti, a, a, a thinking that way that has the potential, and God bless, I mean, thank God for what we are as a nation and, and, and what we, we desire to protect and fight for. But listen, that cannot be how we see God. Like, like it is completely undermined. I would say it's, it may be one of the more foundational issues that the church is now dealing with because we thought we don't need a king. We just need a God. Wow, yeah. He is sovereign God. Amen. King of what? Kings. King of kings. Kings of everything. He is ruler. And what Revelation invites us to, and it says, come on in, come on up. Don't, don't be looking this way. Come on up. And see it from this perspective. He's invited us here, which I love that. We're going to get into that more next Sunday. He's invited us into the throne room. Way cool. What are we going to see up in the throne room? We're going to see first of all that He is God. And He is mind-blowingly amazing. He is God. How much power does God have? Oh my. Oh, are you kidding me? Mind-blowing. How cool is that? I don't, so I have lost our note. Anyway, so, right, so this is the mindset. So a majesty, the moment that we engage with God for who he really is, right. it be, it's going to begin with, under, with a connection of majesty and all of his greatness and all of his splendor and all of his, my goodness, sweetheart, the beauty, like the beauty in these pictures is, is stunning. It's really true. So let's take a look and see what's happening in the throne room yep. that we were referring to. Um, so we know right away, Jesus is the one that gave access right to the throne room. I love it yeah. that it wasn't an angel or some other celestial being. <laughs> it was Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity that said to John, come on up here and let me show you. And we know this from scripture that there is no other access to God, the father, except through Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. Doesn't matter what anyone else says or what culture says that the way to God, the father is through Jesus Christ, yeah. right? Simple. We see these 24 elders. Yep. Pardon me? No, simple math. Well, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> 24 elders. So there's some discussion about what the 24 elders could symbolize. And we talked about how John used significant symbolism throughout this entire book. The 24 elders are possibly the 24 orders of priests, the Levitical priests in the Old Testament, which certainly makes sense. Possibly is referring to the unity of God's people in a sense of projecting into the future of the Old Testament tribes and the, the New Testament apostles could be one, could be both. These 24 elders, mainly what we need to see about them is that they are worshipers. Yes. They are serious worshipers yes. in this space. Yeah. Then we have the four living creatures, right? Which we refer to, there's, there's hints of them in Ezekiel and in Isaiah. Uh, the four living creatures, there's some elements of like the cherubim that we might see in the Old Testament, full of eyes. The many eyes is a reference to Ezekiel 1. The lion, the ox, the man, the eagle, the faces on the different, on the creatures. Amazing. Absolutely. Ezekiel 1, 10 and 18, if you want to look at it later. There's features of the seraphim, another type of angel that we see in the Old Testament with the six wings. And they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty in Isaiah 6, 2 and 3. And they seem in some ways 
to be representative of the creative created order, like with you know man and animals and these things. Of course, God created the angels as well. Um, they're, they represent the whole created order, and yet they also transcend, right? Because we talked about that, that we don't see this on a regular basis. These are all fantastic, fantastic beings. We hear that there is lightning and thunder and peals of, of just big noises, big sounds that are coming Amazing. in this revelation of God's glory. And it reminds us probably your mind went there already to Exodus and Mount Sinai when God revealed his glory to the people and there was smoke on the fire on the mountain and the people were afraid. And they said, oh no, Moses, you go talk to him. We, we don't want to interact with him because he's too frightening to us, right? Yeah. And God's purpose always was that we would be able to approach him. And the beauty of Jesus coming is that we have absolute access into the throne room. Yeah. So when Jesus calls us and says, come on up here, let me show you something, we can go. We can actually go and be with him in that sense, in that spiritual realm of being able to receive from him, to interact with him as we sit in prayer, as we're reading the word. We're that close. Yeah. Sometimes we think of heaven as though it's far, far away. But he's right here with us, as you've already described. Yeah, God with us. Mm -hmm. God far above us, but also God with us. And that's a holy mystery. Beautiful. Beautiful. So as we think about maybe what the throne rooms of the ancient Near East might have looked like, you know, the Assyrians or the Babylonians or whatever, the, the throne room, of course, is where the king liked to hang out. That was his place. That was his, his you know, den with his chair. And they would put on the walls these beautiful like art pieces or sculptures or maybe, maybe carvings of his, his greatest hits, like whatever he did well, if it was a big you know, military battle that he won or if it was he built something amazing, you know, some kind of architectural um, accomplishment, that's what would be on the walls. That's what would decorate the throne room, right? But in this case, God's throne room is filled with worshipers. <laughs> And it was always his intention that we would join him and the eternal church in heaven at the end of time, that we will worship around the throne with God forever. Right, that this is our, this is our destiny. This is where everything is headed, is that we are going to be in his presence forever. But instead of military exploits or some other big accomplishment, what the, the big trophies <laughs> of God's success... That's all of us. That's the redeemed, right? Yeah. We are the spoils of his war I over sin. That. Yeah. That's us. Yeah. We are the right. evidence of his victory. All right. It's yeah. people. It's every one of us that have come to faith in Christ. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 2, 14. He says, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession <laughs> and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. And this is a, you know, could be a reference to like the Roman generals, when they, would, when they would vanquish somebody in war, they would bring all the captives and all the wealth and all the things that they amassed because of their victorious battle, and they'd march it through the streets and give everybody a chance to see how great they are, right? <laughs> but in this case, that's us. We're his trophies. We are the ones that talk about his greatness, and our lives are what is, are what is the revelation of his greatness, that's his it. war that's over it. sin. Beautiful. The third thing we want to maybe look at in regard to what's going on in this throne room is the words of worship. So not only do we have these 24 elders that are casting down their crowns and, and worshiping the Lord and the living creatures that are giving honor and glory to God, they're speaking these beautiful words of worship. Yeah. And I, I think this is something that is, is, um, can be so helpful to us in our own personal worship when we read the Psalms or read Revelation and we see these beautiful poetic moments of expressions of, of glory to God. That these are things that we can repeat back to him. Yeah. It's in his word, we can pray it right back to him. Yeah. Um, and these words are also very vertical. And it's, it's, it's not about really me. It's, it's about him and his greatness. Yeah. So we see that, you know, the four living creatures, the four living creatures in uh, verse eight, each of them with six wings full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty, yes. who was and who is and who is to come. Mm. We see God uh, revealed to us as, as perfect and pure. Mm. His holiness. Mm. Honestly, his holiness should be such a relief to us. Because if we've ever been ruled by somebody who is not holy, if someone who has had authority over our lives who is the opposite of that, we know the pain that that brings. And so the reality 
that we serve a God who is completely holy and completely pure with no dark side should make us feel so secure because he is not going to harm us, right? He's not going to take advantage of us in his kingship. We can trust him. We need that. We can trust him as a good king. Yeah. Uh, the, the repetition of holy, holy, holy comes from Isaiah. Isaiah 6, 1. You know, we see Isaiah saying, you know, when, when King Uzziah died, I, I saw the Lord and he was high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. Beautiful. And he sees the angels and they're repeating those words again. Holy, 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 holy. is the Lord God Almighty. Yeah. Yeah. And Isaiah's response was one of repentance. And he says, oh. Woe is me, he says, for I am lost in Isaiah 6. He says, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of people who have unclean lips and my eyes have seen the king, right? The Lord, the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 6, 5. His response is repentance. And that's another thing that happens in the throne room. Not only is there worship, not only is there uh, this beautiful interaction between me and God, but if there's something in my life that is displeasing to him, and we, and we pray on a regular basis, Lord, search my heart, know my thoughts, see all the things that are, are churning around inside my life, God. See if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in your way everlasting. That we can repent and come to him. And in Isaiah's case, the, the angel came and took a coal off the altar of, in, of incense or, the, or from the, the burnt offering and purged his lips. And he says, you're clean. Repentance is essential in revival, right? Yeah. As we're talking about what are the things that stir revival? What stirs wonder? Yeah. We see this need because, for repentance. So, so let's connect the dots. Invitation. Come on up. Come on up where? Not earthly. Not corrupted. But let's come on up to the heavenly. Let's go up to higher places. Let's go up to where everything's perfect. But most importantly, let's go... To where God reigns and rules. And all the activity that we're going to do. Is going to be ultimately foundationally from that place. We'll see that next week. Powerful, powerful pictures in chapter 5. So, and then we're like. So what do I do here now? What's it look like? What's it going to sound like? Uniquely. The other, all the other demonstrations are like, it's like, I mean, John's clearly struggling to find words, but provided by the Holy Spirit. So those are powerful imagery. But these are the actual words. The way it's presented here, these are actual words that are being said. That's amazing. Like, if you've ever not sure what you're supposed to, how you're supposed to worship, like, could I suggest just go to the basics? And in fact, it becomes a good guardrails for what real worship is going to sound like. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It goes on. The angels go on with this other. It says worthy is the, is, uh, is the other expression that gets talked about. Worthy are you Lord God to receive what? Tell me. Honor and power. You know, you know who did this perfectly well? Jesus. On earth, he, wor- he, he provided a, a road map for what worship is going to look like. Because he was always giving honor to the Father. He was always giving glory. It was, I'm here to glorify the Father. Like, how amazing is that? How do we, how do we learn how to worship? Again, it's this, we just follow Jesus, right? And he says, and it, it, it really a great summary here. By your, your will. So we get a, get a, a real glimpse here. Um, so, can I suggest we've got a little bit of a, a challenge that all of us must be aware of? That we're all a little bit stuck in this century. Very disconnected from the idea of a king of kings and all his glory and all his majesty. So we're going to need to figure out a way to extricate ourselves. Like, to be intentional about moving myself into the realms of God, away from a mindset and a culture that has so insteeped me in self-worship. And how do I know it's self-worship? Anytime we're making it about ourselves. Because we can even, we can even sing songs. And when, 
and there's nothing wrong about song, great songs of deliverance. I mean, that's, that's absolutely appropriate. It's part of our praise. But we don't land there. We don't land in what God has done for me. We land at the feet of Jesus in the throne room that says, God, You are everything. And worthy of all praise. Jesus said it to the Samaritan woman. Seriously, sweetheart. He, just, he, he totally loves on her. And he said, the hour is coming and now is here. It, do you want to be a true worshiper? So I, I ask us today, how many want to be true worshipers? Like really, true worship. What's that going to look like? Jesus, in very clear words, He said, we'll worship the Father in spirit and what? And truth. So one thing, there's so much to be taught here, but I, I just would say that. That, that means we're going to let the Spirit move in our spirit, the very center of our being, the core of our being, and in order to give adoration. So worship at the end of the day, it's the activity of loving God with, I mean, literally, with everything that is within us, right? I mean, like our whole heart. And I, I'll just, we're just going to go one step further. Because when you look at heaven, how many know when you read this, that's not natural? Like, well, that's what we would say. That's not normal. Did you catch that? So, so shouldn't our worship also be not normal? Be not normal? I... We've been invited into a supernatural worship. You know? And that looks like what? Like, let's catch this next line here, sweetheart. I'll let you explain that. So we've been invited into supernatural. And there it is. It really is such a holistic life expression. To, and like the greatest commandment when the Lord says, we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Everything that makes us who we are, yeah. that offered to God. And I, you know, this is, I, I think this is another one of those things that we really grow in. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a daily, you know, sometimes inch by inch surrender of my life to him and I have like little parts of me that are surrendered and then other parts that are that are much harder further away and there's so much grace and, and I think we, we can't worship without the help of the Holy Spirit and I think that's one of the main yes. things one of his yes. enormous functions in in our lives as believers that we have the Holy Spirit within us to empower ministry certainly and to to help us with you know sharing sharing our faith or the life of Christ in us but it's also to help and guide and purify and direct our worship, right? Because mm. he's the worship leader. And we pray this a lot of times <laughs> in the worship team when we're getting ready. It's good. Holy Spirit, you're the worship leader. Help us just to stay in step with you. Yes. We just, we just want to walk with you Amen. today, right? Not get in your way, not run ahead, yeah. not fall behind. We just want to be in step with you. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I think it really is. It's, it's this everything that I am more and more in an increasing measure yeah. as he gives grace and pulls us along in this life that is in him, we respond with love and honor toward him. Yeah. Because affection and, and, you know, squishy feelings aren't enough. There, there has to be the honor and the obedience. Yeah. Otherwise, he's not king. There has to be obedience. And it's, I just, I, I can't say it enough because it just feels like it's such a visual thing. We are in like this gravitational pull. Self-worship, self-worship. It's about you. It's about my, it's about my things, my freedoms, my provisions, my reach, my, 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 my. Folks, at the end of the day, it's not about us. The moment that real revival is going to break out is when we, the church, rise up and say, God, it's all about you. We're ready to set aside everything that says it's about me, my schedule, my time, my money. It's about you, God, at the end of the day. I'm ready to break out. I'm ready to break out. All those things that God has given us, all of our blessings of this great land that we live in and the great freedoms we have, those are privileges, amen? Those, those financial resources, that house, that car, that beautiful spouse, that relationship, the child, the grandpa, all of it, they're resources, they're blessings that God has showered down on us. But we hold them like this. But we don't hold Jesus like this. Folks, check this out, please. We don't hold God like this. Just, boy, it's been nice visiting you this morning. 10 o'clock service, that was good. One of my uh, sweethearts. Oh, wow. 
you know the third bay in our house. Um, I don't go there. It's a tool room. <laughs> and uh, what's surprising is I don't go there that much either. But I've got really great tools because my grandfather was a carpenter and passed down. My dad was a, as a carpentry and did work as well. And so I've got all sorts of like tools. And I so don't know what most of them do. But I've got all the tools in my tool. I like, you need something, you come and talk to me. And, uh, but there is this one tool that I know. Does anybody know the real name of this? Roland, I'm, I don't, you, you don't get to say it, but. So what's it? Yeah, curl bar. Yeah, kind of. It's called the Wonder Bar. I am not kidding. When it was designed, this one in particular, this size, it's called the Wonder Bar. Now, here's what it does. You used to see it. It's the coolest thing. I, this is the one tool I know how to do. Like, because I love demolition. You want me, you need help? I'll do demolition. <laughs> Rolling, come by, fix it. My dad, come right. So this gets between spaces that you're like, man, I got to get this thing separate. It goes, you, it's just, I mean, really, it works. The leveraging, it's so wonderful. Just Hence so the wonderful. name. Hence the name. Yeah. I think we need a spiritual wonder bar right now. It says, God, help me be separated from the things of this world in order that I can go up into the higher places where the realms of prayer and blessing and provisions where I get divine insight and divine revelation that pierces darkness. Now I've got, I'm in higher places. But that's not going to happen if I'm truly trying to do it the world's way. Come on, stand with me. How many know what I'm talking about, right? If I still want to do it like human terms, our worship is going to stay natural. Church, let's, let's, let's get the pride. Come on, right now, like right now, we're going to sing a chorus. I know we're, we're used up our time here, but we're just going to get a little freed up in this moment. Sweetheart, I'm just going to just, have you, just lead us into your... Worthy is your name, Jesus. Yeah, you deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Sing it. Go ahead. Worthy Let's is it. your Come name. On. Jesus. Nothing going on up here. Just, just you deserve focus on him. the praise. Focus on the Lord. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. Oh God. Jesus. Coming in you right deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name. God, we need Jesus. you. Here's the darkness, God. You deserve the, the praise. Worthy is your name. My pain, my Worthy is your name. We bless you, Lord. Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Oh, God, we need you. Worthy is your name. Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. We worship you. You're glorious and holy. Forgive us, God. Cleanse us from surrender us, Lord, from everything that is unrighteous, unholy, God. Unholy affections. You are the God. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. 
picture of the courtroom of heaven, throne room, is this amazing picture of just, of these 24 elders, Jen was talking about. Here's, here's at a bare minimum what that represents, what that reveals, what Jennifer said. It reveals worship. And I just would just add this other piece to make sure you catch, we catch this. It is, it really, it's the expression of the church in unity and it and it's when she circles Jesus when she sort of like like goes around and there is this beautiful picture of what it why congregational worship is so important because we're going to forever do it in community we do not do this alone we and we have to learn this on this side of glory we need each other i'm going to ask if you just grab the hands of some people next to you or you have to move just a little bit or we're just going to close this and and then I'm just going to, I'd actually, I'd be available down here to pray with anybody if that's, yeah, boy, if, if the Holy Spirit's moving on you, like, please just don't miss this. But just grab some hands and just, let's just lead out in that space. Come on, just, just grab the affections of the Lord. Be part of your connection with the persons on your left and right. blessing and honor and glory and power forever lord the dominion is yours the greatness is yours the majesty is yours alone oh lord yes give you all honor yes all thanks to the name of the lord the one who sits on the throne the one who was and who is yeah and is yet to come <laughs> give you glory <laughs> might and power to you jesus praise uh, your name Worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. Strengthen us by your grace. Thank you, God. To you, Lord, be all the glory and honor. Forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. To him who sits on the throne and unto the land. To him who sits on the throne and unto the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and power forever. If you would, I'm going to invite you to let your conversations be on the other side of the doors, the thresholds. We're just going to remain in here for a few minutes and just enjoy some extended time of worship. Again, Jennifer will be, and I will be down here to pray with anyone or just want to find a place to kneel. Can we just, can we grab that chorus just one more time? That's just, that's so perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you. Unto the Lamb, to Him who sits on the throne, and unto the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory. To him who sits 
Thank you. 